actually in this case he took it a step further even telling King Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was and this dream that uh, Daniel interpreted for Nebuchadnezzar was it's a very prophetic dream it's a very historic dream because he ha it has to do with history past tense and it has to do with history still yet to come in the future um, a very prophetic dream where four kings are involved actually five kingdoms but four kings and uh, uh, he deals mostly with the the fourth king which was Rome and uh, we're going to say a whole lot more about that vision uh, as we get into chapter 7 because in chapter 7 of Daniel Daniel has a, a vision that lines up parallels with uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the end time events and what will unfold as we move forward a time that I think we are already deep into uh, very prophetic uh, things that we'll be dealing with and we'll talk a whole lot more about that when we get into chapter 7 we'll actually come back uh, to chapter 2 in Nebuchadnezzar's dream but today we've moved into chapter 3 uh, where uh, we see Nebuchadnezzar seemingly and I say that word on purpose seemingly has a change of heart seemingly God has done some things in Nebuchadnezzar's heart uh, for us to understand that let's start in verse 46 and look at verses 46 through 49 of chapter 2 uh, this was at the end of the dream and the interpretation in Daniel chapter 2 verse 46 the Bible says then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Now, I've heard a lot of messages about this particular event, and usually it'll go something like, how many of you know that our God can make all kings bow before us? And, uh, you know, a victorious message because obviously that's what's going on. Here you have this pagan king that is falling prostrate. How many of y'all know what it means to be prostrate? That's flat on your face. That's as low as you can get, stretched out. So here we have this pagan king lying prostrate <laughs> before this prisoner of war before this Jewish slave, and, and our God can do that, and our God has done that, and our God will do that, but there's times that he doesn't. So we don't want to always get caught up in the victorious uh, points that we see in Scripture because it isn't always like that, but it is amazing. And it's, it seems that this, this king who is a, a pantheist, he believes in many gods, it seems that he's had a great change of heart. I mean, he's fallen prostrate before Daniel. He's paid honor and give him offerings and incense. He said, surely your God is the God of gods and the king of lords or the Lord of kings. And that sounds like a really good change of heart. The only problem with that is, as we said, this, this, this king is a pantheist. And what he does, instead of having a conversion, he just adds our God to the list of gods now to his credit he does put our god at the top of the list but how many of you know that's not good enough because our god is the only one on the list are y'all all right he's not added to the list he is the list there are no other gods little g under our god capital g and that's what we need to understand about our god and so here he sets daniel up in a regal style uh he even allows Daniel to make requests on behalf of his friends, and they get to accompany Daniel on his ascent to the top. But all of these changes still doesn't represent a king's changed heart. And we know that 
We have lots of evidence as we move forward. What a changed man we might think, but his actions prove us wrong. Look, our actions always reveal who we are, no matter what we say. Amen or not? Our actions always reveal who we are, no matter what we say or what's said about us. Our actions are always the telltale sign. So Nebuchadnezzar, he, he didn't have a change of heart like it seems. He just added our God to the list. Chapter 3 shows the heart of Nebuchadnezzar in a very dramatic fashion. And I can, can I just say this before we move into chapter 3? The best way that you and I can really just ring out everything that's in chapter 3 and the best way that we can make the application because you never want to study God's word or preach God's word just for the sake of preaching it and teaching it there's always an application to be made from scripture how many agree with that what I read in God's word what I learn from God's word is applicable that ain't how you say that word by the way but you know what I mean use your imagination it applies to us we we should take it and apply it to us if you leave it here does you no good right if you don't take something out that back door with you why'd you show up so we're here to preach and teach God's word it's our responsibility to apply it and the best the best challenge we can get from it how, the, how many of you like to be challenged by God's word you know you don't want me making you feel good about yourself every morning right now, I didn't made you feel good. I told you you're a good-looking crowd. That's as good as it gets, okay? Relish it. But at the same time, we don't want to take God's Word and try to beat somebody's brains out, do we? We just want to take God's Word and let it say what it says. Make the application. Take on the challenge and watch our life flourish from the truth of God's Word. Amen or not? So we want God's Word to challenge us. We want to be hearers of God's Word, but we also want to be doers of God's Word. And the best way today that we can do that, as we go through chapter 3 and we look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the challenges they face, the best thing we can do is put ourselves in this story. Take out Shadrach's name, Meshach's name, Abednego's name, and insert our name. Because I'm convinced that we have moved into an era, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I want to get my point across, we have moved into an era where you, Madam Christian, and you, Mr. Christian, you're going to have to stand on your convictions. You're going to have to determine who you are. And the best way to do that is to determine who your God is, and that needs to be done before you get into the thick of things. Before the fire is lit that you'll be entering. You need to understand who you are as you relate to your God. And who your God is and how he relates to you. And what he requires of you. What he demands of you and what he expects of you. And we've moved into this new era where our culture has shifted seemingly overnight. By the way, our culture hadn't shifted overnight. We've been working up to this for generations. The chickens just finally come home to roost, as they say. So we're going to have to face the fiddler, and we're going to have to stand on our convictions, and we're going to have to be people who are unwilling to compromise in our faith. So put yourself in this story as we move forward. Starting in chapter 3, verse 1. You there say amen. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 90 feet high, nine feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, that's a pretty high statue. These side walls on this building are 16 feet. So you just do the math, use your imagination, 90 feet high. It's probably the highest thing on that plain at that time. So it was easily visible. It was only nine feet wide, so it was very tall and very narrow. But it was a statue of him. Now, he had just fell prostrate before a slave and said, Your God is the God of gods, and your God is the Lord of kings, but I'm going to make myself a 90-foot statue. You think he had a changed heart? No, he didn't. Guess who Nebuchadnezzar's favorite God is? Nebuchadnezzar is Nebuchadnezzar's favorite God. So he built this statue uh, for it to be worshipped. Verse 2, he then summoned 
the, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and the other pro providential officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other providential officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, as soon, as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Now, just a side note that, that helps us understand the accuracy of Scripture. I just read an article this week where an archaeologist thinks what he's pretty sure he found is the platform that Nebuchadnezzar's statue sat on outside of Iraq. Babylon is modern-day Iraq. That's where Babylon was in those days, just changed the name. And they're pretty sure they found this, the platform that this statue set on. Archaeology is biblical accuracy's best friend. For those of you who wonder how we know that the Bible is accurate, archaeology backs it up. History backs it up. You can't prove it wrong. Matter of fact, I double-dog dare you to prove the Bible wrong. I really do. You can't do it. How many of y'all old enough to, to, to know what double dog dare means? I mean, that's serious. It's not just a dare. It's a double dog dare. Okay. So here we are, and, and Nebuchadnezzar has set up a statue uh, of himself. Why, why would you build a statue of yourself, by the way? You are in love with yourself, aren't you, Charlie? You want to be worshipped. You deem yourself worthy to be worshipped. This, this guy deemed himself worthy to be worshipped. But then in verse 6, there's a command that he must be worshipped. The command comes with dire consequences too, and it's immediate consequences. You worship me or else is the command. True worship can never be coerced or demanded. Look, when you come in here on Sundays... And, and I'm, I hope Chris hears me. I, it just drives me crazy when worship leader says, stop the song. Y'all ain't singing. Well, they don't want to sing, sir. They don't want to sing. That's not worship anyway. Singing ain't worshiping, right? Because some of y'all can't sing. <laughs> Notice where I sat this morning? There's a reason I'm down there. I got kicked out of the band. Singing ain't worshiping. Worship comes from your heart, right? Why do we worship? Why did that first song resonate with everybody? I'm just a nobody. Because we get it. Man, we're just nobodies. We're blessed to be here. We're not privileged people. We are privileged people. But we're, we're not anything unique or special. God's grace has given us an opportunity to come into his house. And because we have a high view of God... We sing from our hearts every time we get here. I am just a nobody, and I am living for Jesus, and I want to sing about it. Now, we could, admit, we could hand out shock collars at the door. <laughs> every time you don't sing, <clears throat> oh, we'd get it out of you. That ain't worship. That's what Nebuchadnezzar was, he was willing to settle for that. When you hear the music, you stop, you drop, and you rock and roll. All about me. All about... Sandra's back. Did y'all know that? Sandra's back. <laughs> Verse 7. Everybody worships. Everybody's on board or you die. That's the gig. So when the music stops, starts, you stop, you drop, you face that statue, probably the tallest thing around, 
and you worship Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, we're putting ourselves in these three Hebrew boys' place, right? So here's the question we need to address right off the bat. When everybody else is doing the wrong thing, what do we do? That's easy to say sitting in here. Now, don't stick your foot in your mouth because we're in here and we're all friends and, and, and probably most of us are Christians and we're all about Jesus or we wouldn't even be here. And, and when everybody else is doing the wrong thing, we do the right thing. That don't matter in here. Out there, out there is where it matters. When society is going that away, chances are we need to be going that away. Remember, that's what God called us out of. That's what God marvelously, graciously saved us out of. So when everybody else has become sellouts, even though they know it's wrong, when everybody else is willing to compromise when it's demanded, what should God's kids be? Well, do we sell out? Do we compromise? Do we go along to get along? Let me tell you, the word tolerance has infiltrated the church. That's not a good word. I know that sounds like a good, wholesome Christian value that we should have. We should tolerate. Well, you know, Jesus hung out with sinners. Yeah, he hung out with them for a minute so he could tell them to go and sin no more. He didn't waller in their sin with them. He called them out of their sin. That's why he was there. Friend, listen, if you're here this morning, here's the message for you. You're a sinner. Your sin separates you from God. The only road back to God is through his son, Jesus Christ, who can wash your sins away by the blood that he poured out on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago that me and you guilty, damned, deserving sinners could be reunited with a holy God. That's the message of the cross. That's what you need to hear. We don't want to be sellouts. We want to stand on our convictions, even when everybody else is going the wrong way. Well, we better determine who we are before we get there. Because trying to figure out who we are in the midst of the mud is a hard thing to do. So we want to determine who we are before we get there. Look at verses 8 through 12. A lot of scripture we're going to look at today. Let's start with verse 7 because I didn't get to it. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples of the nations and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. Those Jews would be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews who have, you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Three Hebrew boys. Everybody else is doing the wrong thing. But these three Hebrew boys do the right thing. Now, I want you to think about this. These are three POWs who have since arriving in Babylon been promoted to the upper echelon of leadership in this world power called Babylon. They have arrived, man. They have an office with a view. They are barking out the orders now. They arrived as prisoners taken in war. Now they have a position that... One could only hope for. They stand to lose all that. They have become part of the king's staff. 
And this uh, pretty plush position is what they stand to lose. But not only their position, they stand to lose their lives. And it's amazing to me uh, the accuracy or, or the, uh, the attitude of these three Hebrew believers. Can I tell you, I think that uh, many Christians put in that position would fail. And can I also say that I think many Christians will be put in that position in the days ahead. I, I think this is the kind of thing that we face. Let me tell you this about Nebuchadnezzar. And this, was, this, 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 was, this happened 600 and some odd years before Christ was even born. So we're 2,600 years removed from that, give or take. Nebuchadnezzar is a, he is a type of Antichrist. He is a forerunner to the Antichrist because what the Antichrist will do at that three and a half year period where the great tribulation starts, he will set himself up. Matter of fact, Revelation describes him uh, producing a statue to be worshipped in the temple of God and he will demand that the world bows at his feet. So Nebuchadnezzar is simply a type of what's to come for this world. This is not some ancient relic of a story that will never unfold again. This is just a precursor to what's going on. So I can guarantee you there's going to be some, some people saved during the tribulation after the church is removed that is going to be forced to either compromise or die in their convictions. And friend, on the path to the tribulation, we, the church, who are still here, I believe with all my heart, we're going to be forced into a corner where we have to either stand on our convictions or we're going to have to compromise. I pray that we have figured out who we are in God and who he uh, is in us and what he expects of us and we're able to stand on our compromise. We better determine who we are before we get there, though. And what we see here are three Hebrew boys who knew exactly how they were going to react before they ever got in this position. They knew who they were in their relationship with their God. Verse 12 says, as the astrologers came and snitched on them. Boy, I can't stand a snitch. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Here you got some guys that are supposed to be looking at the stars. They're looking around at everybody else. Verse 12 says, the astrologer said to the king, they pay no attention to you, king. You getting this? These 12 nothings, they understand the decree that's been issued. They're so settled. You ever heard of being comfortable in your skin? They're so comfortable in their relationship with their God. They have such a firm resolve and such a firm understanding of what their God is able to do and, and what their God expects out of them as his children that they don't even pay any attention to it. I can see some 21st century Christians doing this. Oh, Lord, we've got to call a prayer meeting. Oh, my goodness. We've got to get together. We've got to, make, we've got to figure out as a group what we're going to do. God's already told you what to do. I love it how it's written. They don't, hey, K King, them boys ain't paying you no attention. You're the most powerful man on the planet. But those guys act like you don't even exist. You know why? Because next to their God, he don't exist. They understand that he's the king of Babylon because a sovereign God has decided that he can be king. And that's the only reason. And so they're not even paying attention to it. You know, my mind's a little weird. And I can see them dudes at a restaurant, three of them, with one of their old buddies, their, he, their, their Babylonian buddies, who, who's going to do the deal. And all that music goes off. And they're sitting there and the salad's been served and the main meal's just been sitting sit on the table and uh, that old Babylonian hears the music and he hits the ground. I can see them three Hebrews say, well, he ain't going to eat that. <laughs> I think that's how little they paid attention to this king's decree. He's busy right now. Hand me his bread. He's not going to eat that. He's not, he not going to eat his desserts. Just give it to me. I can see them doing that. That's how little attention they paid 
to the most powerful man on the planet. I'm one of God's kids. You're one of God's kids if you know his son, Jesus Christ. What attitude should we have? We worry, we fret, we shake, we shiver. We try to get direction from the evening news instead of God's word. We're worried about what everybody else is thinking instead of what God has said. What kind of kids are we? We ain't like these Hebrews, are we? Not if we're going to act that way. Wait a minute, preacher. Now, Romans 13 tells us that we're supposed to submit to the governing authority. So, if you're going to remain biblical about all this, these three Hebrew boys, they're kind of out of line. They don't line up with the Bible. They're to submit to governing authorities, and he was the king, right? Wrong. Friend, listen. Romans 13 teaches us that governing authorities have been established by God. To carry out God's work. In doing so, they are to be a punishment to wrongdoers and they are to protect us. And when they establish rules and laws that go against God's law, then we are to serve God every time instead of man. That's a no brainer for God's kids. I mean, that's how simple it is. Are you saying that? Uh, when, 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 when the law says do one thing and, 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 and the Bible says do another thing that you don't even pay attention to it, boy, that's my take on it. That's my take on it. That's exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They paid no attention. They went on about their normal lives. They're walking along, the music plays, the whole city stops, drops, and worships Nebuchadnezzar. They keep right on trucking. Why? Because they don't bow to false gods. They don't, they don't do that. That's not what God would have them to do at all. Uh, I, 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 look at verses 17 through, or 13 through 15. Furious with rage. You know, that's what truth and faith does to people. Makes them, makes them furious. Have you noticed the anger in America right now? I mean, all these so-called movements that's going on started off with an agenda. Small window, this is what we want to achieve. This is what we're about. This is our doctrinal statement. But it always winds up where God gets involved. They always bring God into it. They always bring Jesus into it. They always come against Christianity. Why is that? Because truth and faith enrages those who practice a lie. There's nothing more convicting than the truth. And this is truth. It's absolute truth. And what you see with Nebuchadnezzar in verse 13, this furious rage that he flies into because he's got a good idea about their God and he's got a good understanding of why they're paying him no attention and it's all about their God. Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, verse 14. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true? Now you got to remember, these guys are on his staff. Get your minds right. These, these are not still three Hebrew boys that are in the experiment. These are guys who have walked out of the experiment that he put them in, head and shoulders above everybody else. They are members of his staff, the king's staff. So he has somewhat of a little bit of compassion for them, but he's been enraged by their rebellion. And so he says in verse 14, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods? Or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? So they're given some options here. And the options are you can burn 
or you can become a sellout. You can compromise your faith in your God. Notice he says, if you are ready to fall down and worship him. If you're ready to fall down and worship him. You know, I think about uh, what we see in Christianity today and the lack of, uh, the lack of uh, convictions, the lack of a, a willingness not to compromise. I think about how many Christians, when put in that situation today, would have had thoughts of compromise go through their head. Thoughts like, uh, well, it's just a statue. Because what we do is we rationalize things. You know, it's just a statue. It's not, not a big deal. I mean, I can fall down. I, I just don't have to worship. I ain't got to say nothing. I can just kind of go through the motions. I can just kind of do that. That's compromise, big-time compromise. Uh, I'm going to lose my position if I don't do this. My, my office with a view, somebody else is going to be sitting in there. Surely God wouldn't bring me this far and give me all this and expect me to walk away from it. Surely God wouldn't do that. And then even more importantly, my life is on the line here. I'm no good to anybody dead. To use a phrase from an old Western movie, there's a lot more things worse than dying. Compromise is one of those. I think for these three Hebrew boys, none of those compromises went through their mind. I don't think for a minute they ever thought about, it's just a statue. I don't think for a minute they thought about their position in his, on his staff. I don't think for a minute they even considered their life. You know what I think? The only thing that went through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's mind is Exodus chapter 20. Thou shalt have no other God before me. That is the only thing that went through their mind is I'm not bowing down to this statue because I cannot, I will not, I won't not, I will not have any God before my God because when compared to my God, there is no God. That's the only thing that went through their mind. I will not bow down before the statue. I don't care what kind of music they're playing. I don't care how many city uh, speakers they've got mounted throughout the city so we can hear them. I'm not going to bow down no matter what it costs me. They had a firm understanding of who their God was. They had a firm understanding of what he expected out of them. And they had made up their hearts. Let that stick to you. They had made up their hearts. Come hell, come high water, come the government, come whatever, come a fiery furnace, I am not going to compromise my God. I'm just not going to do it. It's not permissible. That's where they were. So what does determining who you are before you get there prepare you to do? It prepares you to do big things for the glory of God. Not when you get in the fire, not when you get in the mud. Before you get there, your mind's got to be made up. You got to understand who your God is. You got to understand how you relate to Him, what He's willing to do, and what you're willing to do for Him. It will prepare you to do big things. It prepares you to respond faithfully in the face of life threatening opposition, as we see with these. Hebrew boys. Look at verse 16 through 18, favorite part. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king. Everything's on the line, guys. This is it. This is do or die. This is not sitting in a padded pew in a church. This is standing a few feet from a fiery furnace. And here's their response. O king, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. By the way, do you know you don't have to defend your faith? You don't have to get in some crazy debate with somebody about why you believe in Jesus and why you're faithful to Jesus. Your life says all that needs to be said about your following of Christ. You don't have to defend your faith. Let your actions defend you. They said, O oh, king, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into this blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. 
and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. That's faith, isn't it? They can feel the heat from the furnace. That old saying, it's getting awful real, right? They can smell the smoke rise up out of the pit. They know that the one that has control here is Nebuchadnezzar, and nobody can stop. He don't have to ask nobody. He don't have to pass this through a committee. He has made the decree. This is fixing to happen. And they said, King, our God is able to deliver us from you and from a furnace and from anything else. That's faith, isn't it? That's what it takes, right? No, here's faith. Look at the next line, verse 17, verse 18. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. I have all the faith in the world that my God is able to deliver me from the hands of all of my enemies. But if he chooses not to, I'm good with it. If he chooses not to, that don't mean that he's lost his power. That don't mean that he's been limited in what he can do as a sovereign God. That just simply means that he has made a sovereign decision. That's the best decision. And if it costs me getting burned up in a furnace, I'm good with that. That's faith. All these knuckleheads running about talking about how much faith they got and God can do this and God can do that and God is able. What about when he decides not to? Where's your faith then? That's why you see so many Christians, when death enters the picture, they dry up and they leave the church. I'm mad at God. What are you mad at God about? He took my loved one. They belonged to him, didn't they? See, this little small picture we got of God's sovereignty, that's why we stay so jacked up all the time. We don't understand who our God is. Your life is not yours, it's his. Your kid's life is not yours, it's his. This church is not ours, it's his. The air that you breathe is not yours. He loaned it to you. Whatever he decides to do, he will do. And we better get to that point where we say, praise the Lord, hallelujah anyhow. God knows what he's doing. Well, preacher, that's just no cop out now. I don't make no sense. That ain't no cop out. Friend, listen, they're smelling the fire. They're feeling the heat already. That ain't no cop out. Nebuchadnezzar, we know our God is able to deliver us from this furnace. But even if he decides not to, that's real faith. Job said, though he slay me, I will hope in him. What in the world made Job say that? Because God had slayed Joe. No, no, no. That was the devil preacher that slayed Joe. You ain't reading your Bible right. God gave the devil permission. And 12 chapters before, when Job said, Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. God allowed Job to lose his kids. God allowed Job to lose his fortune. God allowed Job to lose his health. God allowed him to lose big. And even though Job was blameless and upright, a man who feared God and shunned evil, God allowed Job to lose everything. And Job's... Conclusion on the matter is, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. That's faith. That's what faith is all about. And in this new era that we're moved into, let me tell you what I think. I think we're going to see Christians dropping like flies. I think we're going to be, see people departing the faith. And the only reason they departed the faith, they's never in the faith. I think they like the notion of Christianity. I think they like gathering up with grandma and grandpa at church so they can say they're Christians. Friend, listen, that's faith. That's what God does in your life. When you come to that point where you can say, hey, whatever God decides with my kid is okay. That's his kid. Now, you can turn on TBN. And you can listen to them knuckleheads that name it and claim it and blab it and grab it and live that away, but you'll live a defeated life, and they'll get your money too. Or you can trust a sovereign God who has your best interest at heart. Let him make the decisions. Give him the reins. You're going to spend eternity with him anyway. 
Leave all this mess behind here on planet earth. Job said, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Job didn't understand a bit of what was going on either. You know, that's the uncanny thing about the book of Job. God never told him why. Wonder how many people used to faithfully attend church, used to faithfully stand on Sunday with their hands elevated and worship to God, and because they didn't get their way in life or something they don't understand about life, they don't even darken the doors of a church anymore. Job wasn't one of those guys. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is not one of those guys. We better make up our hearts not to be one of those guys. God is sovereign. He owns everything. He makes the decisions. On top of that, those friends of Job. You ever read the book of Job? Here comes the friends. Boy, we all got friends like that, don't we? Job's sitting in a, a heap of ashes, scraping the scabs off the boils on his skin. And here comes the friends. Well, Job, if you'd have lived a little bit better life, you wouldn't be in that situation. Well, Job, if you'd just curse God and, and or, or just if you just forsake your sins and turn to God, Job's wife is the one who said, curse God and die, right? You know what Job knew? Job knew he hadn't done anything wrong. Job knew I, I, I hadn't done anything. I've just served the Lord, but here I am. Yet my hope is in him. Well, that's faith. That's the kind of faith we got to have in these last days. All right, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they understand the same thing. If God decides this day that we need to burn up, then praise the Lord. But we're not going to bow at that statue because God has made a sovereign decision, and we're okay with it. By the way, where's Daniel in all this? Where's Daniel? There's four Hebrew boys. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. You don't see Daniel's name mentioned in chapter 3. Where's Daniel? He's got pull, man. Daniel's the one that got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego a job. Why he ain't on the scene? Why isn't he there negotiating their release? I mean, these guys are about to go into the pit. Where's Daniel? Can I tell you what I think? I think Daniel's praying. See, because there's no way Daniel could not have known what's going on here. He wasn't on vacation. He wasn't down in uh, Key West, Florida on the golf course. Daniel was in Babylon. He ain't missing this. He's getting this. But I, I think Daniel is somewhere praying, and here's what I think he's praying. I don't think Daniel's praying for God to get them out. I think Daniel is praying that they can endure this in such a way that it glorifies God. Now listen to me, and I ain't mad at nobody, but I'm a realist. We wouldn't pray that way. We wouldn't pray, Lord, put your heads of protection around Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Father, whatever you decide, give them the ability to their last breath to glorify you as God. We wouldn't pray that way because we don't understand God's sovereignty. See, we want to fill the blanks in for God. We want to pray things like, God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're in a bad way. Like he didn't know that. We want to pray things like, hey, God, Nebuchadnezzar's fixing to heat that furnace up seven times hotter than it's normally heated up. Like God don't know that. God, show up and show out. God, fall on the place and crush the enemies of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hey, God, are you there? He's there. He's already there. Listen to me. God cannot ever not be there does that make any sense to you god can never not be there he's everywhere but our prayer life is like we want to remind god of something we want to fill in the blanks for god because you know i know he's god and i know he spoke everything into existence and i know he's running this deal but if he just listened to me i can help him out and get these boys out of this Lord, just bless them. Lord, just pull them out. Pull them out so your name will be glorified. Is it, is it more glory for God when we're pulled out and don't have to go through? Or is it more glory for God when we do go through and we come out the other side going?
Fargo strut? That's my God. Who gets more glory for that? When we go through the mud, through the fire, through the torment, through the pain. But we come out on the other side. And then we meet some other body that's going through the same thing. And you get to say, hey, let me talk to you a minute. Come here. Come here. Come here. Let me, t- let me tell you what God did for me in this. Let me show you some scars I've got. That's when God gets the glory, right? Or when we get to say, man, look, I was in a free fall, headed for the crash. And right before I hit, God got me. Because he can do that too, right? But our prayers needs to line up with God's sovereignty, doesn't it? Lord, may you receive all the glory out of this. Listen, friend, we don't ever get anywhere in life. And God goes, how'd that happen? How'd they get there? I wasn't ready for that. That ain't the God we serve. He knows before we get there. Are y'all all right? <laughs> Determining who we are before we get there means that we have a firm understanding that our God knows where we are at every second of every day, and he's got a plan. He's got a plan. And that plan is best no matter whether we understand it or whether we agree with it. That's still the best plan. Verses 19 through 23. I'm going to preach all day. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious. He even got more madder than he was. He was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude toward them changed. See, he gave them an option. Because like I said, he had compassion. These guys are on his staff. And he's got compassion for them. He said, look, boys, just fall down. I wouldn't doubt if Nebuchadnezzar would have said, look, just fall down. You don't even have to worship me. Just get down there. He was furious now because you know what they did? They paid him no attention. He's furious toward them. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, wearing their robes, trousers, Turbans and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing fire. I want you to take note of what they're wearing. They're dressed from head to toe. We'll talk about that in just a second. I'm going to give you a thought on that. From head to toe, they're tied up. They're thrown into the blazing fire. Uh, Verse 22, the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men firmly tied fell into the blazing furnace. Get a picture of the furnace now. It's not like a modern furnace. This is a pit. This is a pit with an elevated platform above it. And and material is put into the pit to heat it up, heat it up. So they had turned up the burners, if you will, on that seven times normal. And obviously there was a ledge that you had to walk out to to shove someone in this pit. And old Nebuchadnezzar, he he's got a he's got a box seat up there. He's looking at the whole thing. And it was so hot that when they walked up there to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in there, the soldiers got burned up. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 24, was thrown in, or verse 23. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. And he said, look. I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of the gods. He didn't even know how to explain what he was seeing. The fourth looks like the son of the gods. 
Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted. Now, let me ask you this. How long do you think they stayed in there? Well, we don't know, do we? There's no details given. But if that furnace is so hot that it killed the guards when they got close to it, and now Nebuchadnezzar can approach the opening to holler in there, I would say common sense tells us they've been in there long enough for that fire to die down. A while. And when Nebuchadnezzar gets a look, he don't see three. He sees four. What does it tell me and you? No matter how hot life gets, we're not in the fire alone. The faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, Nebuchadnezzar, God can deliver us from this. But if he chooses not to. But when they did get in the fire, God chose to do so. And he got in the fire with them. You know what I believe? I believe with all my heart, if those boys had been incinerated, God would have been standing there to catch their ashes. That's what I believe. But he chose not to. In verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched. And they had no smell of fire on them. You know, I do a lot of Dutch oven cooking and campfire cooking when I can. I can be around a campfire. I can walk close to a campfire. And when I get close to my wife, she says, you've been around a fire? That's how, that's how smoke smells. That's how sensitive our noses are to smoke. And the Bible said these boys didn't even smell like smoke. Why were they fully dressed, by the way? You know, I can't prove this. I don't know. But I just get this feeling that that God sent them into that fire fully dressed because they were going to come out of that fire like nothing ever happened. The rope's gone. Their hair wasn't singed. Here's what I see. I see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that evening meeting a friend fresh out of the furnace. And uh, the the friend says, hey, guys, what y'all been doing? Oh, we've been in the furnace down there trying to burn up. Nothing wrong. We're good. What's for lunch? You know, we're being funny, but can I tell you seriously, with every every serious bone in my body, that's the confidence God's people ought to have. And for centuries, the reason we've lost our confidence in God is because our dependence has really been on ourselves and not a sovereign God. I told y'all when I started preaching this sermon that God had did something big in my life, and the big thing he did in my life was he helped me to understand he really is sovereign, not just a little bit sovereign, but sovereign over everything. Life, death, salvation. God is sovereign over everything. That set me free. See, I don't have to get up here and beat my head against this pulpit so some of y'all will get saved. Because understanding God's sovereignty tells me that no matter how loud I get or how soft I get, no matter if I preach a long time or a short time, if you're going to get saved, it's going to be because a sovereign God reaches into your life and draws you to him. I can't hinder it and I can't help it. I can just preach his word. It set me free as it will set you free when you understand God's sovereignty. Let's get finished so I can set you free. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. By the way, you ought to write this under that verse if you can. This is the results of being stand-ups instead of sell-outs. God gets the praise. When you're a stand-up for your faith instead of a sellout of your faith, God gets the glory. This ain't about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're not the heroes of this story. Daniel's not the hero of this story. There's only one hero in the book of Daniel, and it's a sovereign God. There's only one hero in my life and in your life, 
and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets the glory. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, sent, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants, they trusted in him and defied the king's command. And we were willing to give up, and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses burnt, turned into piles of rubble. For no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Who gets the glory from all that? God does. God does. If you're a child of the king, wherever you find yourself in life, know that God's there with you. Know that God's there with you. If you've been praying, Lord, get me out of here. Lord, help me. Maybe you ought to alter that prayer to, Lord, just give me the ability to glorify you through all this. Just, Lord, on the other side of this, because I know you're going to see me through it one way or the other. May your name be lifted up. Why do we want God's name lifted up? Because the Bible says when his name is lifted up, he'll draw all men to him. For what? Salvation. For salvation. Bow your head and close your eyes.